Now, the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Corumbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome, everyone, to the Friday edition of the Three Martini Lunch, along with Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Good, bad, and crazy martinis for conservatives today. And, Jim, we begin with the good. Tomorrow night is debate night. Yet again, for Republicans, this time in New Hampshire, with just a few days before the New Hampshire primary. This one is hosted by ABC. But there's a fantastic, and Trump would say a fabulous, first-class debate-watching party sponsored by National Review that unfortunately is sold out. But you will be up there uh, to kind of soak in the the ambiance of the final frenetic home stretch uh, before the New Hampshire primary. But the good news officially today is that once again, there will actually be a conservative asking questions. We saw that with Hugh Hewitt at some of the CNN debates, and now we're going to see it with Mary Catherine Hamm being one of the four panelists for uh, the ABC debate. There's uh, David Muir, the anchor of ABC News. There's Martha Raddatz. Uh, there's, I believe, a WMUR, which is a big local station in New Hampshire. And then Mary Catherine Ham uh, of Hot Air. And, and you can see her writings in other places as well. Uh, Jim, this is great news on a number of fronts. First of all, there's a conservative on the panel. Uh, she's extremely bright, extremely articulate. She'll do a great job. And for uh, for Mary Catherine Ham, I can't think of a better way to start out this year after some of the things she's had to go through. Yeah, uh, yeah, obviously a a tragic year for her. She's gotten through with unbelievable strength. I I should say the full disclosure, Mary Catherine Hamm is a a friend, I think uh, very well of her. And you go down the list, you know, Hot Air, Town Hall, uh, occasionally the Weekly Standard. Greg, Mary Catherine Hamm writes for just about all the finest uh, conservative publications that aren't National Review. Um, (laughs) So we'll work on that, you know. But uh, no, she, she was probably about as good and I would argue probably about as universally respected a figure as you could find on the right um, reached out and you know she is prepping she's put a lot of thought into what kind of questions she wants to ask uh, we'll see whether she gets a full chance to ask a lot of questions or whether they just kind of roll her out for like little cameo appearances like it felt like for uh, Hugh in that first CNN debate having said that Greg can you think of any candidate on that stage who's had a problem with women women questioners <laughs> Uh, who tends to get personal, who tends to feel very threatened if he gets if he gets a really tough question, and uh, active on Twitter and tends to lash out and evaluate uh, women based on their appearances. Does any, any name come to mind in that scenario? Honestly, I think he's going to go opposite. I think when it's over, assuming they don't get into a big dust-up, uh, he's going to say what a fabulous job she, she did, and he'll probably say he prefers brunettes. Yeah, I was going to say, if you thought I was anti-Trump before, <laughs> uh, if he takes a shot at her, boy, you know, it's you just see me frothing at the mouth. Look, we'll, we'll see how this shakes out. But uh, I think she, it's a great pick by ABC. In a year where a lot of things have gone badly with these debates, and look, people who want to accuse me of being biased, fine. National Review is no longer allowed to participate in one of the debates because we were unfair, Greg, to the <laughs> candidate who's running counter-programming to the debates. <laughs> Um, apparently Reince is cool with that, but you know, we put a cover story against Trump. We're not cool anymore. You know, uh, the next time I see Reince Priebus, who I've been very nice to year after year, I'm going to greet him like that stormtrooper in star Wars, right? <laughs> Traitor. And I'm just going to unveil that little, you know, electronic thing and, and we'll fight it out. Um, a little, little irk with the RNC these days, but, uh, Mary Catherine Ham is a great choice and we're looking forward to it Saturday night. Yeah. And the other good news is that George Stephanopoulos isn't going to be there because it was this debate four years ago where he brought up the birth control question out of absolute nowhere to Mitt Romney only to find out that the contraception mandate was being rolled out by the white house just a few days later. So that's right. Yeah. I guess probably a bet if Stephanopoulos, I should say Clinton donor, <laughs> Clinton Foundation donor and longtime Clinton staff member, you know, Stephanopoulos were there. Do you get the feeling the next question would be, um, Governor Bush, should the Republican Party abandon its stance on mandatory colonoscopies for all Americans? <laughs> what? Huh? You know, why, why? I'm tired of Americans doing it. Republicans calling for this. What? Huh? <laughs> Oh, well, uh, the questions, of course, are still being formulated by the four people who will be asking questions. And there just may be an additional question for Marco Rubio on Saturday night that wasn't in the initial plan, thanks to one of his most recent supporters. Following the Iowa caucuses, three different Republicans have bowed out. First Mike Huckabee, then Rand Paul, then Rick Santorum. The only one to actually endorse someone since dropping out is Rick Santorum, who immediately decided to back Marco Rubio. 
The very next morning, Thursday morning, he goes on Morning Joe with Joe Scarborough and Mika Brzezinski. And Joe Scarborough asks him a fairly simple question. And let's just say Santorum, who is no stranger to uh, tough interviews, uh, wasn't ready for this one. Can you name uh, his, his top, top accomplishment uh, in the Senate, actually working in the Senate, uh, doing something that, that tilted your decision to Marco Rubio? You know, I, here's what I would say about that. I, my, my feeling on Marco is someone who has tremendous potential, tremendous gifts. If you look at being a minority in the United States Senate in a year where nothing got, four years where nothing got done, I guess it's hard to say they're accomplishments. I mean, what you t- tell me, what happened during that four years that was accomplishment for anybody? Well, I but, mean, it was a complete but, 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 gridlock. Well, there's a rousing endorsement. Later on, uh, he finally stumbled around to the point, uh, although he didn't articulate it well, that Rubio was able to insert language into a bill that essentially makes it much, much harder to ever bail out the health insurance industry. But uh, two big issues here, Jim. First of all, outside of that point, immigration is the issue that Rubio is best known for, and it's not a big advantage for him this year. Secondly, it's always great to get endorsements, but you might want to be a little more careful about who you send out to make your case for you. Well, apparently, the, the word from the Rubio folks is, A, he didn't tell us he was going to do this. So thanks. For, you know, we could have briefed him. We could have gotten up to see could have a little talking points, little note cards to have him ready. This is showing up in a Christie ad, apparently uh, the, the Jeb Bush Super PAC right to – is it right to ravage? I think that's the way they, they're they approaching their job. Right to rise is going to put this in an ad. Um, look. As a first-term senator, Marco Rubio doesn't have an astonishing level of legislative accomplishments. Um, you could argue about whether that's a fair criticism or not. You could argue with Obama being president, there's not a ton of opportunity there to get big pieces done. Getting that point about the risk corridors in Obamacare probably represents the most significant uh, thing he's done. I suppose you could do that. I think the bigger question is apparently Rick Santorum had another exchange about this today, and it didn't go well a second time. <laughs> At this point, Marco Rubio would really love for Rick Santorum to endorse somebody else. <laughs> I'm joking when I say that. I'm sure Rubio would rather have it than not have it. The final thing I'll just add to this, Greg, is that every single time Rick Santorum says, look, I'm the conservative and I'm endorsing Marco Rubio because he's the best conservative choice. And you can trust my assessment of the best conservative choice. Somewhere, Greg, I picture Pat Toomey just looking at his television <laughs> and glaring. <laughs> And remembering in 2004 when it was uh, Arlen Specter against Pat Toomey. Arlen Specter, the guy who eventually joined the Democratic Party and probably among the, the least conservative, most liberal Republican senators of, of recent memory, Rick Santorum, Mr. Conservative, endorsed Arlen Specter. Um, as did George W. Bush, as did Dick Cheney. And they probably did it out of personal loyalty, et cetera, et cetera. But every time, you know, Santorum runs around saying, I'm Mr. Conservative. You know, Pat, I've, tr- I've talked to Pat Toomey about this a bunch of times. I keep trying to pull it out of him. Because you know this has to irk him. You know it has to drive him crazy. And he's such a polite man. And he just, he just gets quiet, Greg. He just doesn't <laughs> want to talk about it. But you can just kind of see like the, the fingers drum against the table. <laughs> Someday Pat Toomey is going to explode on Rick Santorum. And, and he too will be yelling, traitor! But that day is not yet today. Oh, man. Would that be the same Arlen Specter that finished that final term as a Democrat, right? That is. Yes, mm. exactly. Good good call, Senator. Good yeah. Senator. yeah. Call. Well, well, Toomey's on board with Rubio, too, now. So I guess they have one more thing in common. That's, that's going to be an awkward <laughs> Pennsylvania rally right there. <laughs> Can you drop out as an endorser or at least as a public endorser? Because it hasn't been I a mean, good start. <laughs> do you picture... At some point, Rick Santorum, when I tell you Marco Rubio is a conservative choice, you can trust me. I know how to pick conservatives. And I'm just picturing to me in the background. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, if you think that's dysfunctional, let's move on to the crazy martini now. On a couple of different fronts, Hillary Clinton is just uh, baffling in the depth of how bad of a candidate she is. First of all, she went to the Uh, CNN Town Hall with Anderson Cooper on Wednesday in New Hampshire. He asked her if she still thought there was a vast right-wing conspiracy. Like any question she may not be expecting, she immediately greets it with this really loud cackle and then said, of course, except it's not a conspiracy, it's out in the open now. Yet her campaign is now out there suggesting that Bernie Sanders is fomenting a conspiracy theory about the true results of the Iowa caucuses. 
Results, by the way, that the Des Moines Register, which endorsed Hillary, now says really smell. But that's not all. Uh, Last night was the MSNBC debate, moderated by Chuck Todd and Rachel Maddow. I was busy watching the ESPN movie on the 85 Bears. But from what I'm told, Jim, uh, there was this dust up uh, between Sanders and Hillary uh, because Hillary mentioned that she had the endorsement of prominent people in Vermont, including Pat Leahy and Howard Dean and so forth. But Sanders tried to turn that into a populist advantage. Here's that exchange. Secretary Clinton has the support of far more governors, mayors, members of the House. She has the entire establishment behind them. That's a fact. I don't deny it. Look, I've got to just jump in here because, honestly, Senator Sanders is the only person who I think would characterize me uh, a woman running to be the first woman president as exemplifying the establishment. I can't be establishment, Jim. I'm a woman just because our party's chaired by a woman and the top Democrat in the House is a woman and I've been in government for 20 years at the federal level on some capacity. How can you possibly call me establishment? Greg, as we all know, the entire establishment has testes. (laughs) I hope you can use this, Greg. I hope I'm not working too blue today. This is where she is. Like I, I had made this point early on that like she was running as a status quo candidate, and if you had to say who had more impact on American politics over not like not, let's say over the last thirty years, let's take the clock back to nineteen ninety two. You can argue obviously Barack Obama. You can argue George W. Bush. You can argue probably maybe Dick Cheney, and you can argue obviously Bill Clinton, maybe Al Gore. She certainly has had more influence for a longer period of time. I mean, when she was first lady, she was running the health care initiative. She was obviously the power behind the throne, a forceful voice in her husband's administration. When she was a senator, she was probably simply by virtue of her celebrity, one of the most influential Democratic voices on Capitol Hill, voting for the Iraq war as Bernie Sanders would like me to remind you. Um, (laughs) Then, of course, she becomes uh, becomes Secretary of State and is the architect of our foreign policy for those stunning happy years from 2009 (laughs) to beginning of 2013. So she's had a big hand in shaping. Like if if you, you know, I, I remember at one point somebody wanted her to run against Washington. I was like, are you kidding me? Hillary Clinton is Washington. It's not just that she's lived there, as it, that she's probably been – in fact, as I go over that period of all those names I mentioned, Hillary Clinton might arguably the most, be the most consistently powerful person in Washington over the past 30 years. So if she wants to run around and claim she's not con- you know, the establishment, it's kind of baffling. It's a really clumsy uh, playing of the gender card. It's kind of amusing – uh, to see this desperation, I wonder how Bernie Sanders feels being called, being accused of sexism like that. Um, I, the the probably the most the craziest part of this martini, Greg, is that the audience just didn't laugh that argument out of the building. <laughs> All right, uh, Sunday, of course, is the Super Bowl. Super Bowl Fifty, as a matter of fact. Denver Broncos against the Carolina Panthers. Both were the top seed in their respective conferences. I believe the Panthers are about a six-point favorite. Uh, Peyton Manning, obviously the sentimental favorite of many since a lot of folks believe this is his final game. Who do you like? Who do you want to win? I'm going to pick the Panthers to win. Uh, I would say they've been really good this year. You know, Cam Newton has just been off the charts the entire year. And feeling a, a kinship to South Carolina, I guess that's the team I feel more geographically or, or you know, connected to. I have a bunch of fans who are Denver Bronco fans. Here's the thing. If he loses, if, if the Broncos lose, it's going to be rough for Peyton Manning. And there's two reasons, Greg. The first being is he'll be one and three in Super Bowls. Right. And when the you know, conversation of greatest quarterback of all time, statistically, Manning belongs in there. He's got a lot, you know, a really solid record. All the, the, the statistics point to it. Uh, but people will hold that against him. And I think the second and probably the more glaring problem there, Greg, Eli is never going <laughs> to let him, you know, let him live it up. <laughs> Eli's no. going to say, look, you know, I – don't you hate it when your two Super Bowl rings chafe against you? Oh, you only have one, big bro. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I forgot about that. The Chargers are my AFC team, so I have an instinctive loathing of the Broncos, but I have great respect for Peyton Manning since he spent most of his career not in Denver. I'm pretty much apathetic towards the uh, the Panthers. I don't dislike them. I, I, I enjoy Cam Newton. I think he's a great player. Ultimately, I'll probably pull very slightly for the Broncos, but I fully expect the Panthers to win I just hope Peyton Manning, whether he retires now or retires later, that he does so still able to use all of his limbs. 
Hoping I come out of this game okay. <laughs> <laughs> on that cheery note, Jim, enjoy the big party up in uh, New Hampshire on Saturday, and we'll talk to you on Monday. Big weekend. See you Monday, Greg. Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today, and be sure to tune in again on Monday for the next Three Martini Lunch.